fact, a learning platform. Uh, Pata and I thought we should start with something about teaching in medicine. So uh, it gives me great, great pleasure to uh, welcome my batchmate from MBBS, uh, Amit Kumar Ghosh. He's a professor of uh, medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. He's been associated with the Mayo Clinic at Rochester for almost 20 years. And he ha has several publications. His uh, interest is in uh, teaching. And uh, I will, uh, you know, let his words uh, you know, speak for himself. I will not bore you with a long uh, introduction. I have even more great pleasure and honor in uh, welcoming Professor Seth Raman, who was my teacher. Uh, and uh, Ghosh's teacher too uh, at uh, Jipma Pondicherry and uh, all I had to do was send him a WhatsApp message and he immediately accepted despite it being very late in Malaysia. Uh, Professor Setraman is the Dean of Medical Faculty at the, uh, let me get it right, AIMST, University of Malaysia. He's been associated with the organization for uh, almost 10 years. Everyone in Jipma knows about Professor Seth Raman's passion about teaching and teaching methods. Uh, he virtually started the NTCC, NTTC at Jipma. And after that, he has uh, pioneered teaching methodology as well as uh, examining a methodology for medical students. A warm welcome to you, sir. And thank you once again for joining us. Uh, uh, Ghosh, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vidya. Thank you, um, Pata Radhakrishna, my, my very close colleagues, my friends, and my teachers, uh, Professor Setu Raman, uh, Prof Professor Anand Krishnan. The topic you have chosen for me to speak today is very close to my heart. It's pedagogy in medicine, how to become an accomplished medical educator. I've been in the education line for over 25 years, and pedagogy is trying to find out what are the best teaching um, techniques which are around. And being, being taught by some of the best people, um, I reached out to my colleague, Shubha Ramni, who's my classmate uh, from PGI and now a professor in Harvard Medical School. She's a world-renowned medical educator. And I said, Shubha, um, I have this talk to give. Can you help me? And so she really refined some of my ideas and I'm going to share our combined ideas to you. The aim of the today's talk, and by the time the talk is over, I would, I would really feel that I've done my job if I could have you understand some of the key teaching principles and strategies in the year 2020. You'll also reflect on some of the challenges and develop solutions of current day teaching much more advanced than the challenges our teachers faced when I was a student in the 1980s. And, and I will reflect on some of the new strategies that we would expect our participants to adopt in their own teaching. Now, the most important thing which um, I wanted to say that we had a book called Samson Wright in Physiology. And I was told that the first edition of Samson Wright had a picture which they took out down the line we said that the relationship between a teacher and a student is that between a cow and a calf. As much as pleasure the cow has in feeding the calf, the calf has in, in feeding from, from the mother. So it's a very close relationship. And that's, that's very essential to our teaching principles. It's probably got lost in the hustle and bustle of things, but needs to come back. And that's one of the key messages I wanted to give. But what is most important is reading is not enough. As you can see from this slide, we remember only 10% of what we read, 20% of what you hear, just like what you're doing now, but 30% of what you see, 50% what you see and hear. So at the end of the talk, maybe 50% of what I say will be retained. 70% of what you say, so when you teach, you say you remember a lot more, but when you do in a workshop or in other settings, when you say and you do, then you retain 90%. So it's important to have our, ed our educators uh, go beyond just talking and demonstrating what they are really meaning for their learners to learn. So here with the traditional pillars of medical education, which I was taught, I was told that you learn the medical knowledge, read all the books, 
know how to be a great diagnostician by physical exam and, and show your problem solving skills during your exams. And that's good enough. What unfortunately was not focused too, too much in great detail, which we had to learn as we went, was our communication skills. But we thought that these were the four pillars and this was enough. But the modern world has gone a bit more advanced. So now the current day, what do the learners need to know? It's very important for our educators to know that in the current day, the learners need to know knowledge. They need to demonstrate understanding. They need to have some generic skills on how they manage the day-to-day -day issues. They have to show great cognitive skills to differentiate between the different situations they are in to show that they have acquired wisdom. They have to show specifically subject specific skills like uh, Dr. Mohan Raman has to show she's great in anesthesia and I have to show that I'm great in medicine. And then finally, most important because we are a profession, we need to carry ourselves properly. We have to have the right attitudes and engage in a lifelong learning. Only a very small fraction of our entire professional life is in medical school. Maybe four and a half or five years of a long career of 40 to 45 years. So to, have a, to be a professional, our educators have to inculcate the sense of lifelong learning in our medical students. So that is very key that it is not the end, but it's the start when you finish a medical school. These domains are well known to you. When we are relating to the domains, we, we, we cannot talk about the Bloom's taxonomy. We have to know there are three big domains where evaluations happen. These are the knowledge domain, the skills domain, and the attitude domain. All three are equally important, even though in the compressed curriculum, we sometimes give more emphasis to the knowledge domain where we try to see have the acquired knowledge by test, do they are, are they able to make a medical decision making in the ward rounds? In the physical science, we want them to demonstrate the adequate science to show that they have doing well in the psychomotor domain, they're able to do procedures and surgeries, they're able to communicate, write notes, and also communicate with each other and phrase their consult questions well. The attitude sometimes, the focus sometimes is less, it's becoming increasingly important professionalism, values, emotions, and feelings, and sense of empathy and how we convey our empathy to our patients and our colleagues are becoming increasingly important. And the term which is referred to now is called emotional intelligence as much as our IQ, EQ is equally important. Gone are those days where this is still very important when some our teachers have to teach us in a very, very short time. Pedagogy is important where you sit down, listen to a teacher in a very gurukula kind of system, and you gather a lot of information. However, for lifelong learning and for residents, and when they go from beyond the third year, fourth year medical school to residency and lifelong learning, we have to follow what is called the andragogy, using the adult learning principles. All these adults, as you can see, they are of different ages. They're bringing different experience. They need to know what they want to know and not what the teachers want them to know. So we have to sit down with this group if you have to teach them to find out what their aims are, what their goals are, what they want to achieve and where they want to go and how can they bring their thinking power to a solution. So it's not that we know everything, it is this group which will figure out and then we have to give them a feedback and evaluate them to see what they can improve, what they've done well. So adult learning experience is becoming a required curriculum in almost at every advanced medical schools and everywhere. Most important, I cannot emphasize, you can, you can do the best curriculum, but you have to provide the environment. This whole thing about pimping, about ragging students, they come from, so that's why this is called space. This comes from the Maslow talks about physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging, esteem and self so here, learning, they have to feel safe that they're not being judged by their color or by their race or by their parents uh, who have demonstrated over the long
very mild and they are the leaders now. To the, to the learning engineers when they realize that they're learning. So we cannot be judging. The community of learners have to be supportive and the ST by their colleagues and by themselves. So this is the key. Now, where does the learners in the outpatient settings and the specialist things in structured uh, case based they're doing now and they've learned, had a very good basic science course, they should be at least able to talk about it. And they don't need to know all of it, they need to talk about it. And I will show you how you can grade your students based on their level of training and not have one size all. You cannot have the best student in your class be the marker with which you judge the rest of the students because that would be hurting their self-esteem. Now there are different self-learning styles and a lot has been talked about that some students learn by seeing, some students learn by hearing, some students have to write notes and write and keep revising it, and some students really need to feel it. The combination is this is more of a myth. There are many such learning signs, but most good students or most students apply more than one different technique. So an expert uh, educator has to make sure that in, the, in, in their talking, or they're presenting, they're using more than one modality of education. So they're stimulating, what do I see? What do I hear? What do I feel? Kind of feelings in their students. Most important is to realize that there are different kind of learners. And there's not a good learner or bad learner. Uh, the surface learners are very smart. They are skimming the surface. They're worried about their marks. They're always scared of failing. They're into the rot learning. And they're always asking you, about the assessment, how will I be assessed? On the other hand, there are some deep learners who'll be sitting corner, they'll be, they're more of intrinsic, maybe introverts, they, are, they have curiosity, commitment, they can analyze new, stu new knowledge, and I can remember several, several of my great friends who were in this category. But the best students, it, it's figured out that they are called strategic learners. They both use this, the concept of deep learners and the surface learners, and they keep, are changing from one to another based on the situation they find in. So as a good, good teacher, we have to find out where our learners are and what are their methods of learning, not criticizing, but observing and, and, and learning from them. Now, there are different generations, as we have learned, and the, the group which we are going to be educating. Um, our way of, our, we were, uh, the previous group, we had to, we had to learn by taking notes, or attending board reviews and all that. My current students are very unique. They learn by simulation and they want immediate feedback. If they don't get feedback, they get very upset. Uh, it is not enough to say you've done well. You have to tell them what they've done well and what they can improve. Surprisingly, the millenniums do a great job in group activity. They like to be taught in a jeopardy style. So it'll come as 200 for uh, infectious disease, 200, uh, 300 for Cardio cardiological science. So they like to be taught in that way. So gaming is a big, big thing in this generation. Um, so they like to be challenged in that way. And they, they come up with a very innovative, interactive exercise. Why do I emphasize that? Is teachers like us who have been trained in the previous generation and have learned this, we cannot use the technique which we have learned saying, see one, do one, teach one. That was a great method when it lasted. Now, we have to, the modern generation, just like Pata and uh, my friend uh, Vidya is doing, using technology. They have zero tolerance for delay. They want to do multitasking. So as teachers, we have to understand that technology is our friend. 
it's not a not something which is which is an impediment and learn from it this is a very important slide it came from the army school it talks about how do you assess a student very fast it's called the rhyme r is reporter i is interpreter m is manager and e is educator so if there is a second or third year medical student i want them to report to me exactly what the patient says i'm not expecting them to interpret but if they can they are very bright but if there is a fourth year medical student i want them to go beyond reporting i want them to interpret the signs and what it is a pgy resident so this is a first year resident should also an intern should be able to interpret all the what the patient is saying now as they advance to the second year they should be a good manager which means they should be able to multitask they should be able to take care of medical students able to manage uh, uh, pgy residents they should be able to manage and when you are in the final year of residency or you are a fellow you have to be an expert educator why is this important is that if i find a pgy2 resident or a pgy resident who's just a reporter and has not traveled has not pro proceeded to the to the interpreter level or manager level i know there is a knowledge deficit i know there is a problem and that's what i want to bring up when uh, when we are evaluating the students and talking to them so this is a good um, kind of a postcard thing to have in your pocket to know exactly where it is so as a doctor as a an educator and beyond of course we are here so this is the highest form of achievement uh, when it comes to understanding and sometimes you will see a very bright pgy uh, two resident who is already an educator and you know these are the people who are going places now <clears throat> so these are the techniques that they are following in the lifelong training um these were not there when i studied these are the zoom cameras uh you you can do your mcqs and you've all seen this used in different formats so having expertise uh, if you are an educator having an expert expertise on how to handle them because these are different platforms it needs some um, learning to be done and needs to get there so the second thing is all all well and good so these are some of the teaching principles i talked about is what are the challenges and how can we develop some solutions about the challenges when it comes to challenges there are many to clinical teaching and all of us who have done here and i really thank my professors who are here my teachers who despite all their challenges and many more than i have faced have taught us what are the challenges time pressures competing demands open opportunistic things number of trainees fewer patients patients are staying very short so before you see the next day they are gone or they are too ill or they are unwilling to be uh, examined clinical settings are not teaching friendly they they seem to be very daunting and the rewards for educators are low the rewards for research is high so a lot of great students don't want to teach they want to become researchers get grants and become professors soon this is one of the hardest job to do uh, because the rewards are poor but i must say that uh, the world is changing the recognition is coming that's why educators like us have become professors i've become a professor i'm in my 11th year now because of the recognition of of this uh, efforts which we have done so i would not let in everybody lose heart because of this most important is understanding that there are different stages of competence so a good teacher will identify in the students that some students are unconsciously incompetent they are not aware of the skills or their lack of proficiency and they have no clue and then the good students become consciously incompetent they will come and say i do not know sir can you help me they are aware that their skills and they are not yet proficient then the conscious competence or they are aware of their skills and they are able to use it but they are using some effort which is still they have to it's like the first is like a third year surgical resident or second year surgical resident um and so they are they are kind of uh they have to have an effort but here comes the master who is unconsciously competent this is like dr ak dr sekur satu raman who don't know how they how they are doing it they are they are cutting through the tissues is going automatic because of their superb skills and the years of training they're able to 
understand and uh, synthesize a huge body of knowledge, skills, psychomotor skills, kinesthetic skills, um, just amazing. So when we were students, we were here or here, uh, looking at a master here and trying to see how we can be here, not realizing that the master has spent 20 years in the craft, but that is reachable with training. So that brings us to our responsibility. This is Professor Harden. Uh, all of you know Dr. Harden. Uh, he has talked about what as uh, professors or teachers, we should be more than a lecturer. The most important basic task is uh, we have to perform the clinical, the basic task which we have to perform. I'm going to show you what is that. Then we have to understand as to what is our approach to teaching. That's what we are talking about. And then a clinician is also a professional teacher. So this is a busy slide, but here is what we usually do, doing the right thing. When I'm in the wards, I'm teaching a time efficient, inpatient teaching, outpatient teaching, teaching at the bedside, assessing the students. So this is doing the right thing. Then I'm trying to find out doing the thing right or what is my approach to teaching. Here's where the lifelong learning has to happen. The pedagogy for teachers beyond students. I have to show the enthusiasm for teaching towards learners. I have to give them the space. I have to understand the principles of adult education. I have to look at the different teaching strategies for the different levels of the learners. We're using the rhyme techniques, uh, using uh, effective feedback, providing them good feedback, modeling, be professional. As, uh, as, a, good, as a good doctor, uh, we have to model. And I, I would remember Dr. Setu Raman and Dr. Uh, Professor A.K. We, the best form of flattery that we could do for them is to imitate what they are doing. And, and not knowing what they were doing, but thinking that by just by imitating them, we would probably be close to them. So this is very important. These were the professional teachers. Everything about them, how they walk, how they talk, how they interact with colleagues, how they hold the hand of the patients, and how they bring us to task. That is a professional. And then the genius of them was to capture the unexpected teaching moment, as I had mentioned in one of my talk, as one of my professors, Dr. Uh, um, Asha Umachegi, got an unexpected teaching moment. There was a Siamese twins being born. She sent people to our hostel to bring us in the middle of the night to see how that, how that thing looked like, how the delivery happened. So these are these amazing teachers. Now the important thing is, how do I grow up as a teacher? I need to solicit feedback. So it's not enough if I've learned. I need to go and attend some sessions to learn about teaching, just like professors like you are listening to me and engaging and thinking what we can do. We need to self-reflect on what is our strengths and what is our weakness. This is where we grow is understanding where our weaknesses are. We have to take professional help in the form of going to professional development. And I will show you what we do in Mayo Clinic. And we have to mentor and seek mentoring. Like I reached out to my friend, uh, Dr. Sh Shubha Ramani, who's far greater educator, uh, a researcher in preparing this talk and then engaging in scholarship. You have to write, you have to speak. Scholarship is not only writing, but also speaking and disseminating. And these days you can do in a blog form. I've used these, some of these things. The first one is called one minute preceptor. It's uh, six micro skills. You've got to get a commitment. What do you think is going on? You ask the student. Then you ask the student, what led you to make the conclusion? So you look at the evidence and how their brain is thinking. You teach them general rules. So when this happened, you do this. Then you reinforce what they're doing right. Specifically, you did an excellent job doing this, this, this. And you correct their mistakes. Don't say mistakes. Next time this happens, try this. Don't say you made a mistake. Like they get frightened. And then you identify the next learning steps. So what do we need to learn more about it? So this is how it is. First, the, as a teacher, I diagnose the patient. Then I diagnose the learner. When I diagnose the learner, I use asking for a commitment, probing for an underlying reasoning. It's more than one minute, as you can see. It takes about two minutes for an expert uh, educator. Then we teach some um, general rules, get the feedback, correct the errors, and identify next steps. So I can do it when I'm going seeing one patient and going to go to see the next patient in the wards I can do this teaching on walking. So this is a card which I've included there. The slides will probably be available to you. 
uh, which we have kept in, in the international medicine clinic, surgical clinic, faculty practice. And every student has this in their pocket so that they can, if they forget, they're like, okay, I'll be asked on these things. So I need to kind of brush up. So you keep doing it again and again and again, and you get better at it. The other thing which is similar is called SNAPS. Uh, S is summarizing briefly the history and physical. N is narrowing the differential to two or more possibilities. A is analyzing the differential diagnosis. P is asking your preceptor. So the student is asking me probing questions. P again is plan the management and A is select a case. You might see several cases. I tell the students you're gonna see several cases. Suddenly they come across a case of mastocytosis or some rare things which we see here, uh, yellow nail syndrome or whatever, and select a case for self-directed learning. And it may be a case on management of heart failure, something common. So I tell them to focus not on the zebras, but on the cases which they're gonna see 70 or 80% of the time and learn it well. So students have a habit to learn the zebras. So the snaps is a good way of learning. And finally, I'm coming to the last portion, which is what are the new strategies? So these are all things that you know. What are the new strategies which you would like you to kind of think about? This is a new concept which has been published. So this is an experience-based learning for the 21st century, which Tim Dorman and his group came up. So it goes about beyond just, beyond, uh, just competence. It shows about the capability. So the final thing is capability. So you the student is here, it goes through this machinery, comes out as a doctor. When, when they are coming out as a doctor, before that they have to show practical capability, which means they're able to handle, uh, understand the case, understand what to do in the ward, what should be the first thing. They have to show intellectual capability of lifelong learning, able to draw from a large body of knowledge. And they have to be effective, which means they're have to have the right emotion, right personality of a doctor, be a professional to get the identity of finally being able to be a doctor. But the work starts really early. So this is what we call the support, where I talked about, as you can see, the support is, over, is, is, is enveloping all the steps. When it comes to support, the support has to come from the organization. How do you create the learning space, the pedagogic, which is the curriculum of adult learning, the effective. So we don't wait till the person becomes a doctor right from the MS medical school first year. We are preparing them to have the right emotions. A lot of our students get into trouble. They get into depression. Um, they, they turn to alcoholism, all because there's a lot going on in medical school. Because of the support and preparation, then we have them participate when there is an interaction between the patient, the student, and the clinician. And that is uh, by before they participate they're, and they're experiencing, we tell them that they're going to do a couple of things. They're going to be observing things which are difficult, like surgical things like we observed or learning skills. They're going to be rehearsing before they do. So they'll be practicing uh, either in a simulation lab or, or in the, among themselves in small group session. And they're going to be contributing when they are coming near the patients. And before that happens, we take the permission of the patient uh, and the patient becomes a partner in the learning of the student. And this is where the real learning happens. Now, why is this experience-based learning? Well, it's also called the SPARK model important. Previously, we had this problem-based learning and simulation learning. That was building, building competence. It was still not showing capability because some of the elements were missing which were called the effective. How do the people react? And in simulation, we can simulate the amount of stress that they will go through, but it was still not the same thing of experiencing. So this is coming back. The whole circle is coming back. Experience is how our mentors learned and how we learned, but it's a different format, making it safe. There's no microaggression. There's no pimping going on. At every step, there is reflection. And this is important. So this is like, how an educator's help, how before they go, they are preparing, understanding the capability, checking the patient's problem, getting the consent uh, by observing, rehearsing, and contributing, as I'm saying. Then they're experiencing on the day, what do you expect? So an uh, uh, educator has to really help the student walk the steps. 
So you provide exemplary clear uh, care and you empower the student and patients to co participate. A lot of students, because if they don't get this experience, they don't want to be clinician. And the downside is by the year 2025, you're going to have a shortage only in US of 45,000 to 90,000 doctors. So students are here to be taught and to be able to replace us and take our jobs. And that's why it is very important to be super reflective, to help the student understanding the real patient experience and reflection becomes a very key. So this is a new form. You will hear more of it. A lot of favorites talked in the medical school. The other new thing which has come up, it is feedback. Feedback is different from assessment. Assessment is trying to find out how's the patients going, how the students be behaving in their, the three domains which I talked about uh, in, uh, in the Bloomberg's, uh, uh, in the Bloom's taxonomy. But feedback is from the learner's perspective, what do we have to say? It is, a, it is a change management approach. It has to be given in a way that is understood. The learner has to understand, has to improve. We cannot scare the learner. If the feedback is given in a way not appropriately, to will scare the learner. And instead of a behavior change, they'll go to a destructive pattern of self-criticism. So what happens is we ask these three questions. Where am I? What do I where do I need to be? And how do I get there? So from the learner standpoint, we ask them what, even on the day one, we ask them, what are your learning goals? Before we give the feedback, we ask them, tell me what you think, how you did in this rotation or how you felt you did. Then we ask them about self-efficacy, about what they can do better or what they have done better. The, the person who's giving the feedback, the teacher, this has to be based on their observation um, personally and understanding the context. So with the feedback, when I'm giving, when the student is in a ward situation or in an emergency room situation or some other situation where it's moving very fast, things are moving very fast, I have to be paying that attention. I cannot tell them you didn't do a good job when the student had just a fraction of the time they could spend with the patient. So these have to be understood. And there has to be a perception of beneficence. Understanding is the relationship is long. We still have a great relationship with our teachers. Uh, Dr. Setu Raman, Professor A.K., Professor Setu Raman, after 40 years, there's a longitudinal relationship. Why? Because they wanted us to grow. They gave us a feedback which made us, we are who we are because of these giants. And the context and culture needs to be understood. So it's a great responsibility for feedback. So this has come out by Dr. Sargent. It's called the R2C2 model of giving a feedback. First, become the friend. Develop, you don't have to just make it extremely safe because learning cannot happen in an extremely safe environment, but you have to have a great relationship, which fortunately we had where we trained and a great rapport with our teachers. So that is important. Then you have to react and then reflect. You have to ask the students, um, as, as a teacher, I have to have them react to their feedback. A lot of students get very angry. They said, well, you have not fair to me. You didn't do this. I need to understand their point of view. And then I need to reflect on myself as to what I need to do. So this R2C2 is for the teachers who are giving feedback. Then we have to confirm with them that we understand what they are saying. And they understand the content of how the evaluation is going to happen. And then we co-create for, for a plan for change. So this is important. After that, we have to do our own feedback. This is a one minute reflection of every educator needs to do. What did I learn about the learner? What did I learn about my teaching? What am I going to do differently next time? So this is a constant process of, of um, uh, to be a great educator that we have to go through this cycle. This used to be the previous model, the Gurukula model. The teachers here is a solar model and the learners are all spinning around them. And the teacher is giving the wisdom like a sun and giving, giving um, their uh, knowledge. Now it's called the lunar model with the teachers here, like the moon, uh, reflecting and basking in the glory of their learners and really appreciating what they are learning and growing. So here is one learner who seems to have grown more than the other. The teacher is equally committed to all three. So the lunar model of training is what is the current model uh, recommended for superb teachers. 
having said that nothing will happen if you do not invest in your educators so if you're dean like professor setu raman and i know he's investing professor ak you have to go to your leadership this teaching cannot happen in a vacuum at our free time so this is a mayo clinic professional development for educators i am a member of this academy of excellent uh, of educators uh, educational excellence uh, and the whole idea is as you can see there are several resources which are available to me i have to constantly go and polish my skills there are going to be workshops hand on and a lot of my teachers surprisingly and i'm not surprised are much younger than me they teaching me about technology they teaching me about new learning theories and all kinds of things so uh, everybody is teaching everybody now in india i know when i was in <coughs> jipmer dr setu raman had started this national teacher training program and we, as students we were going to go there and help teachers uh, refine their skills i am not aware but i'm sure there are many more of these academies which are come up the double the uh, ame is a european uh, um, association of medical educators they have great meetings if you can attend one of them the double amc in us is also a great uh, source of uh, education but i cannot emphasize that because our profession professional career is 45 years 50 years sometimes um what we have learned Uh, is just the start and what we are going to teach and what we are going to learn about each and every aspect from setting the stage of where to teach our our students to where how to give feedback how to how to improve ourselves it will be constantly evolving so the change management which applies to our student has to be applying be applying to us so i have different lectures which i give it to uh organizations which are doing zoom meetings and cpd meetings or cme meetings they have to it's a slightly different approach sometimes they have to use the same principle but slightly different bent so in conclusion this is my last slide medical educators should be aware of the different domains of education and they have to analyze their students on these three domains medical educators have to provide an excellent climate for teaching you have to stop any form of microaggression or um or um kind of a uh, providing and uh, not providing the right environment to your students or if anybody is doing it in your division you have to bring them task and actually talk with them adult learning principle is important because students now they get bored when they are hearing lectures a lot of students just say that give me your slides i can listen in my in my office in my own in my room in my pajamas i can listen but if you are going to show me tell me something so bringing case and bringing having them work through a case is so very important educators need to adopt the learning strategies based on the assessment of the learners so you have to know where your learners are and be fair to them and you have to use your techniques and that's why one size does not fit all evaluation and feedback is essential for both for the students as for the educator without that we will not grow and so this is uh, very important both the summative and the formative formative is as the as the student is going day by day we give okay you did very well here you did very well or you should probably work on that that's the day to day evaluation is called formative and summative is at the end of the rotation you say well we started with these goals and we found out all these things that you did very well but as you mentioned that you could have done one or two things well let's think about how you can work on it let them talk about it let them come up with their answers and you can help them with the with your special techniques so using what i said the lunar model not the solar model and finally uh, as medical educators you owe to yourself just like you're taking the time here to listen to my lecture to attend professional development courses dealing specifically with medical education and also to your own specialty where you can rise above um every other uh, things that you've learned and bring your craft and bring your education and your skills to your students who so deserve it because it is so very difficult to get into medical school and finally to get a title that you're a doctor is so very prestigious so having said that i have left my email here um i will now just open it up for questions and all the 
all the things that I can learn from you. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, thank you very much, Amit. Uh, Professor Sethraman, uh, could you take it forward? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Vidya. And uh, thanks, Amit. Well done. You deserve a clap. And uh, first of all, before we go further, uh, National Teacher Training Center at Jipwar no, started in 1975 when I was a second year postgraduate. So I joined it in uh, 11 years later in 1986. Of course, when uh, we started this uh, orientation program for postgraduates, which many of you went through, uh, that was done during my time when I was running the thing as uh, a project officer. Dr. Anathakrishnan is my senior in uh, NTTC. He joined uh, three, four years before me. And um, so therefore, um, it was actually credit goes to Dr. D.B. Bisht, our principal those days, for going to Sri Lanka and uh, joining this movement for uh, bringing pedagogy to medical education. And uh, uh, in those days, in 75 to 90 and all that first 15 years, in fact, it was, if you belong to a teacher training or talk about medical education, people will laugh at it. You know? Even Dr. Professor Chandrasekhar, when I was nominated for the 1986 course, he said, why do you want to go and attend your, your students say you're a good teacher, don't go and get spoiled. You know? <laughs> That's what he used to say. So later I realized, after working there for about 20 years, I realized that there is an essential difference. The easiest way I can explain to those who are professionals in your group and wondering what is all this talk about pedagogy and things like that, anyone can teach. The difference is that of a musician and a musicologist. A.R. Yeah, Rahman may make you know, pleasing music that becomes world number one hit and all that. But if you ask him what is the secret of the success, he won't be able to explain. Because he is a, mus a musician, he is not a musicologist. But a person who is a doctor, you know, PhD scholar in music, he'll be able to analyze and say, oh, he's Mozart from Madras, that's why he's so catchy. And he will give the solid uh, reasons based on music as a science, why people like it and all that. So that is a difference. So we were uh, good teachers, uh, are often self-made, just like uh, S.P. Balasubramaniam, who passed away recently. He was a, a totally self-made singer. Nobody, he never had a formal training. So they are all examples of uh, where the art is there in the innate art, but it can always be polished. In every field it is there. In tennis, Ivan Lendl uh, was supposed to be his uh, example of hardworking chap who worked very hard to cultivate his skill. He had no natural talent and coaches used to get uh, uh, angry with him. You go and uh, uh, be a cowherd or something, why you want to learn lawn tennis, you know, that kind of thing. But he persisted and then he became world number one for several years. So there are two things, nurturing and uh, uh, natural. Jipmer, the main advantage with all your gang, including me, who was the first batch who wrote entrance exam, is pre-selected. Some 200,000 people write and a lucky 30, 40 or 100 of us get in. So obviously pre-selected. Uh, so therefore, um, it was easy to teach in the sense, you know, basically all our high achievers, to give a challenge, uh, people rise up to that. But I found that even in Jipmar, out of 75 students, there were three to five in every batch will be laggard. In your batch also, double batch, I think it must have been double dose. I, uh, probably eight to 10 would have been there. I wouldn't, have been, I wouldn't be surprised. My job actually, I realized early was to bond with them. And I always took special care of additional batch. The main batch, the overall gold medal winners and the high achievers. No? I'll just, if you ask, I'll help. But my thing was mainly to take care of them. So AK may talk about that later. We call them snacks in uh, the other university where we work together. Students needing additional curricular support. So all the backbenchers remember us because of that. So with that, uh, as an introductory talk, now I'll ask um, for any comments, clarifications, questions. 
from the floor from your batchmates first then finally ak is it okay amit if your yes, batchmates sir. ask to grill you a little no, bit no no that that's uh, the the feeling like like you said i mean even though uh, 75 of course everybody cannot be the first student but it's so very unique to get a position in a medical school uh, i'm exactly like you the the top 10% doesn't need my help so even in jipmar i spent a lot of time me and my friends just kind of improving ourselves so that we all all finish the journey together and i'm proud to say that um, our batch has done extremely well we had a 40 year uh, reunion and i was there is no i mean everybody is a superstar and it would not because i think they had different learning styles they needed different inspirations and then they found their match and they meet somewhere else i have students whom uh, uh, my i myself as a student has thought what is this fellow doing um they're not learning anything doing something they are big ceos of companies and hospital cares because their mind is very different they process the world differently so it took a these things were not automatic uh, just like medical school curriculum you have to go and learn spend time in understanding bloom's taxonomy strategies and you're absolutely right uh, students who are very good teachers who are very good they don't know what they do well and it's called tacit learning because that they do it automatically it's like driving they get to the place of work and they don't know how they reach there because they're so good but phd educators and these papers which i have talking about are all phd educators who have followed um and shadowed very experienced educators and seeing kept noting what are these educators doing which are very good and they they get it uh, what they call it's a qualitative study they capture all the ideas then the main theme behind the ideas and then they study them in small group and they study them in large group and they find the validation between these two group and then finally it comes out in the open so a lot of strategies don't make it because it's just a theory and it's not practice but some of the things which i showed you is what exactly every educator in mayo clinic now we have uh, 1500 doctors uh, i mean consultants like me and 3500 uh, resident staff fellows we have 65000 employees and they are also in an educational part thing like allied health nursing and all that but everybody doesn't get to be an educator here you can see patients but to be able to go to be an educator you have to go to that academy of education excellence take those classes demonstrate competence in knowing understanding that you're able to give good feedback matching your skills and even then there is competition to be the best educator because there's so many good educators based on the feedback of the students uh, you are uh, you uh, you are up for an educating role so here we have that luxury i know in other hospitals we don't have we give too much work on the professor has to do surgery research education and they are not given the resources so these resources are easily obtainable now they are there on the web um and you just need some time in your busy schedule to set up that every education leader has to set up all these faculty member who join before you become an educator you need to take these essential classes and they will grow Uh, amit if i can ask you a question what prompted you take up uh, teaching as a very special interest area and what made you a very attractive teacher in mayo clinic well rewarded and awarded um let me show you i don't know whether you can see this 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 is my name tag i'm bringing it closer oh sorry you see there are three shields here the the biggest shield is called is practice the shield on the right is education and the other shield is research to be in mayo clinic to get a job in mayo clinic and to succeed here you have to be good in at least two shields very few people can do all three shields together like research education and thing so i have been fortunate because um being trained in some of the best places in india you were the guys who made my life miserable when i was in jipmar because you were so good and i was trying to catch up with you guys that by imitating you guys you learn something right so we learn from each other because they were so good like i have a whole bunch of colleagues whom i would just imitate vijay raghavan um shri kumar all these people and you learn from them 
And then you were, I went to do Chandigarh and that was a very clinical heavy, education heavy group. So it came naturally to me when I came to the University of Minnesota to do my residency. I had already had all the trainings and I realized the clinical training was missing. So Indian educators do very well in US. Ashubha Ramni, my friend from Fiji, she's from Stanley. She also had the same training as me and she did her PhDs and all that. Um, this was just to remind me that my talk is finishing. I should shut up and have <laughs> a question and answer and put a reminder. <clears throat> so research, I do educational research also, but this is a natural flair I have um, of connecting. I think part of the reason being empathy, understanding that teaching is a, is a privilege uh, empathizing with students is a privilege, just like our teachers, AK and uh, Dr. Seturaman, they would be overjoyed to see us succeed. And that is a gift which um, we wanted to part, just like you are doing, Fatah, you're doing a tremendous job with YouTube, bringing far and wide people from all over the country. So I think we need to, we get a flair of where our strengths are. And if, if, if you're good at singing, why don't you sing? If you're good at teaching, why do you stop, you know, why don't you do, uh, why don't you stop teaching? Like if you ask Tendulkar, can he be Lata Mangeshkar? He can't. He's good at cricket. And same thing, Lata Mangeshkar can't. So we have our own strengths. So teaching comes naturally. And then after that, I had to spend time in understanding all principles. And it was a realization, self a realization what I was not doing right. So unfortunately, US gives us the platform. There are great, great, great teachers. And they're not all in medicine, they're in <clears throat> science fields, philosophy, uh, whatever you need, you will get it here. And so they were all very helpful in shaping my career. And then things happened. I guess the rolling stone gathers moss. I just kept rolling and capturing something and it's, it's, but it all started meeting you, meeting Vidya, meeting Nim, meeting uh, Lion, and meeting AK and, uh, and, and the environment of, of Jipmar. It was amazing, amazing. Prof. AK, any comment from you? Please unmute and say something. Thanks, Amit. It was uh, wonderful hearing you. Sir, it would be nice to see you, sir, if you're seeable. <laughs> yeah, you can see me after I finish speaking. <laughs> First, the bandwidth is poor and then the voice tends to go off. Thanks, Amit. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, your speech today. And uh, it has sort of... <clears throat> re-emphasize to us about the changes which have taken place from the time when we were students till to the time that we were teachers and uh, to the time that uh, we are now almost past teaching and we are watching others perform. Now the thing which comes to my mind is that the principles that you enunciated were very, very new to us when I joined Gipper as a teacher in 1977 because we used to model ourselves and on our teachers. We never knew that pedagogy was a science till we experienced the National Teachers Training Center and uh, spent some time there. I spent 25 years of my life in the National Teachers Training Center. And it's an awakening every day to learn what we were doing wrong and to see how we could do better and to understand the science of teaching because till that time we had worked only on the art of teaching from our teachers. But what strikes me is uh, in the light of what you said is and I would like to take this opportunity of highlighting that the challenges that we face today as medical educators in India and some of my colleagues who are also in teaching like 
Neem perhaps will uh, agree with some of the things that I am saying. You have the benefit in the United States of four years of college before they join medicine and therefore they are a little more older, a little more mature and probably when they choose medicine it's an informed choice almost always on their own desire whereas we have 17 year olds who till previous day were in school and 90% of them are in medicine because of pressure from family or parents or some other reasons and many of them don't know why they are in medicine Therefore, this introduces, particularly in recent times, in my post Gipmer days, I notice we have a huge number of students who lack motivation. You can teach a student who is a little problem in understanding concepts. But when you are faced with the majority of class which lacks motivation, then a different issue arises altogether. And as Seto mentioned in passing, we have students needing uh, additional curricular support. We call them the snacks group and those require a little more serious attention, additional psychological support. We call them snaps in the place where uh, Seto was vice chancellor for five years and where I continue to work now. That's a whole uh, difficult, uh, different ballgame. The second thing is, <clears throat> we had a compact group other than the double batch of 65 to 75 students in Jitmar. Luxury over the 30 years that I was working there. The only batch which was unusual was your batch. But before and after that we had 65 and 75 students. Now I have 250 students with very little uh, increase in resources and with only marginal increase in number of people who are supposed to teach them medicine. That is another issue which is very, very difficult. Thirdly, there's a huge regulatory gap in India because medical education is very tightly controlled by regulators and hardly any innovation is permitted because assessment is under their control, the curriculum is under their control Short of uh, holding your hands, they are doing everything else. And the regulatory response to these increasing difficulties sometimes takes 20 years. The last curricular revision was 1997 for the MBBS course. And the next one came in 2017 or 2000, late 2017 implemented from 18. So you can imagine 20 years, no change in the curriculum. And the last post-graduation revision was in 2000 and still it is ongoing and we are still to see the new curriculum. Therefore, what happens is you try to be innovative, you engage them in new methods, but the assessment is under control of the regulators and there's a huge disconnect between how they learn and how they are assessed in the exams. And it's very difficult to meet that gap because if you teach them the same way, they'll probably welcome it because it will help them to pass. But that's not necessarily the best method of learning medicine. So we are struggling with that issue. You very rightly mentioned about formative evaluation. And I regret to say after 50 years in teaching that there is no worthwhile significant formative evaluation in medicine till today. There is a nominal formative evaluation in the undergraduate course. And you know how these marks are given in the institutes, which has nothing to do with their performance. And at the postgraduate level, there is zero weightage for formative assessment. And therefore, when they know that what they do in those three years does not really count for the final exam other than at the hands of the examiners then their uh, motivation is even less to pay attention to day-to-day -day issues. 
there is also as you rightly mentioned change in patient demographics we have more and more we never had the problem in dipmar we have shortage of patients we have shortage of patients who want to stay in hospitals we have shortage of patients who want to be examined by students and we have shortage of patients who are willing to be seen even by residents and therefore this shift to simulation is occurring out of necessity rather than out of need because patients just are not willing and i don't think that's a good substitution to make for simulation prepares you to have an actual patient encounter but if it is to be used as a substitute for learning you're not going to be able to produce very good uh, medical practitioners there is no formal training of teachers and we all learned just by watching our teachers then we try to learn in the national teacher training centers but even today i think about 80% of teachers have absolutely no contact with teaching learning technology pedagogy or andragogy and therefore it's a huge problem for them to understand some of the concepts of interaction feedback formative evaluation and so on and so forth and how they are important in learning and the last thing i want to tell is the total absence of interprofessional education even for a very short part of the curricular period the physicians in training have no idea what the nurses do they have no idea how what other healthcare personnel do they have very little respect for each other they fear for the doctors because in the hierarchy they are higher than the nurses or the technicians and therefore challenges which you cannot imagine which interfere with acquisition of knowledge in medicine these days and i am surprised that uh, still there are people who would like to join medicine these days under those circumstances and uh, continue to learn particularly because it's enormously costly when my son did medicine in dipmar the annual fees used to be 230 rupees <coughs> and i think when you did maybe it was 140 rupees i don't know whether you remember that now it's 25 to 30 lakhs per year to join medicine and you can imagine the huge amount of investment which goes into education it's a struggle therefore the to be in the same place is a struggle and to advance is even greater struggle and my last word is i read something which shocked me that in 1950 the doubling period of medical knowledge was 50 years so if you pass in 50 you can enter service and uh, finish service with the same knowledge in 1980 it became 7 years so as soon as you finish medicine it's time for a complete rehaul in 2010 it was 3 and 1/2 years so you then your course knowledge would double twice and in 2020 it's supposed to be 73 days now if you can imagine you have five changes of knowledge within one year how can ever one keep up with medicine and convey some sense of development to the students so sometimes in retrospect i wonder why i continue to be a teacher but these challenges are there to be met and i am sure we are trying to do our best in the circumstances possible i enjoyed listening to you and it's very nice hearing you talk about something other than medicine and i am glad that your experience in jitmar stimulated you to take up teaching as a profession thanks amit thanks professor ak um your your sometimes a teacher does not see their effect uh, immediately or or sometimes the day to day activity around them is so much that they get shadowed the activity shadows their recognition um but needless to say um and I, you have heard this before and i probably need to hear it again and again and again um your role 
Professor Sethu Raman's role, Professor Chandrasekhar's role, and, and the faculty role, you have trained thousands and thousands of doctors. Um, they are all over the world. They will not get to you and touch your feet and seek your blessings, but we know your blessings are always there and it's be, it'll be there for the rest of our life. We would not be where we are. So it is not that, um, I, do, that I don't understand how difficult it is. In fact, my biggest praise and biggest criticism sometimes when I go to India and I go to Calcutta, and one of the best things which I have learned and I've admired is go to any hospital, whether it's a primary care hospital or a major hospital. And I've spoken in almost all the hospitals in India. I, it's like um, an amazing experience for me. It's like life coming new, a light going up. And I keep going and thanking the primary care doctor. He says, oh, you're from Mayo Clinic, all oh, this. I said, do not thank me. You have no idea how good you are. If a patient breaks his hand or his, her hand, but they have an appendicitis, you're not going to go to Mayo Clinic to fix it. You are the one who's fixing it. You are the real doctor. So you may, and you're working with 1,000 of the resources that we have. The idea about sharing knowledge and not limiting it to either one country or the other is that all of us are in a state of evaluation. Uh, I completely agree with you that you cannot throw the baby with the bathwater because it's a huge investment. It's a huge amount of money you'll need to change all of all, all what you're doing. And finally, the students have to graduate, they have to get a degree. Without that, none of this will work. Uh, so they have to go through wherever training what they're getting. But I think what you did, Professor A.K., and you probably don't realize how we learn from you, is you create a question. You ask why. You ask what can be done. So you create an uh, environment of inquiry. You create the happiness which makes us restless and not satisfied. I think the biggest teachers from Socrates to you, they have not given the answers. They have given more questions and they have challenges. They have not said, oh, you did a great job all the time and things like that. They have inculcated in us that we have the potential to rise and grow and we are not using ourselves because we are happy with status quo or we are happy with a particular grade or a particular rank. The biggest challenge as a medical educator like you are going through and I'll go through is motivating ourselves. It is telling ourselves that we are doing something good even though the recognition is not coming. There's a lot of pressures against us. There's a lot of challenges among us. But even that five minute opportunity you get, the five minute just to see you and to hear from you and Dr. Setaraman will get me going another couple of years. So this is important is to supporting educators knowing fully well that we are resource strapped, resource limited, but we are not strapped here in the brain. We have we've completely expansive. We know what can be done, but whatever it is, we are doing the best it is. I'll give you an example. This famous uh, Austrian doctor, Schwarzer, who got subsequently a Nobel Prize. He was in Africa. He served, he was a surgeon. He went and he was a big burly guy. So there's a gentleman from here, Dr. Normal Kaplan. He went to see him in Africa, wanted to see his practice. So he saw him and this big gentleman, he was lifting boxes of medical supplies, teaching people, the African people. And he also had a piano, which was almost close to being rotten. And he was playing music in that great job. So he said, I was sitting with him and other African doctors and I made the comment. And at the moment I made the comment, I realized I made a wrong comment. He said, you guys are so grateful. I, you're so lucky that you have such a famous doctor, right, sir, in your presence, that he's taking care of you. Otherwise, you would be taken care of by the witch, witch doctors or the local doctors, and that would have been disaster. He said, the moment I said that, I realized I made a mistake. He said, when, I, when the dinner was open, uh, over, uh, Dr. Schweitzer came and told me, tomorrow we are going to go and see what these doctors do, and then we will meet and find out from you. He says, I got up early in the morning, we went there, and he saw this doctor, witch doctor, or what I call, they were the traditional doctors. He was wearing uh, hay in front, and he had some chicken bones and other things in front of him, some color liquids. But he was doing a very strange thing. He was differentiating the patients into three categories. The first category of patient was coming to him 
and he was immediately giving them some red things, something to drink, a blue drink or a red drink, and sending them off within five seconds or just less than a minute. They were off. They were happy. The second group he saw, he went on a frenzy. He went around the patients, hit the chicken bone around them, made a dance and all kinds of noise and song and hit something. And that went on for 15 minutes. So I was very surprised because that was my idea about what they do and he was doing it. And the third group, the patients, when they came, he said, this is not my case. You go to that white man. He's going to take care of it. He said, the cases he was sending to me had big tumors, had appendicitis, broken bones, uh, complicated pregnancies. He says, he's the best triage system I have in Africa. So then Normal says, what was he doing with his other two patients? He says, the first category he had some viral infection, nothing much. He, he, he he, as much as every doctor who has practiced medicine for any length of time knows that there is always an inner doctor within us, which will rise up and heal us. You don't need any external doctor to heal you. So he was giving them a placebo and waiting for that inner doctor to do the job. And the inner doctor did the job. And what was the second kind of patients he was, he was dancing around? He said, these are the patients with anxiety, depression, mood disorders. And he was doing the Australia, the, the African version of cognitive behavioral therapy. He was calming them. He couldn't solve their problem. He was giving attention, try to gather some resource for them. He says, so every person, regardless of where they are practicing, they have devised a way of practicing medicine. It may not be the Western medicine, but they're very sharp. They're the brightest people there. So the challenge I understand, and it's also an opportunity my thing is, uh, when it's a good thing and we like it, uh, even though you have done so much, you have taught so much, don't, I know you will never give up. You are one of those diehard surgeons. Dr. Seturaman is another diehard educator. Uh, don't be afraid. Just stand up. Even do what, what, what we always knew you to do. This is what AK would do. This is what Simple would do. And uh, that was amazing because that captured our attention. And a true impact of an educator like you, you would not know after we finished our medical school. You would know, and you've lived long enough, and you're going to, God bless, another 30, 40 years. You are seeing your impact. If that does not satisfy you, I don't know what else. That is the biggest reward that you have, that whatever you taught us and how you raised us, we are still the inquiring, thinking types, reflective types. Um, and we are singing the same song you did in our own own simple techniques. We are learning new things. So the so the art is we learn from you. The science we are modifying. The application and the delivery we are modifying. But one thing I learned from you and from others is we have to change. We have to adapt. It is not one size fit all. I cannot be just doing chalk and talk and just hand holding and things like that. Our students are expecting, they're doing gaming and other things. So I have to understand what it is. So I go to my son and understand he does things so fast. I'm like, hey, let me take a YouTube video of you so that I can learn your steps and learn from him. That's what we have to do. So Ghosh, uh, one of the things that struck me after you finished speaking is that though it was not done in the structured way or uh, the way you have spelt out, um, many, uh, most of our teachers, uh, you know, encompassed all those points that which you have highlighted now, but they were not done in that structured way or they were not uh, given labels and uh, given time and uh, space and done. But uh, it was amazing that almost 80% of everything that you said, they had done it, uh, you know, long ago, uh, 40 years ago. Uh, I mean, uh, that was uh, truly, you know, it was truly amazing. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you for pointing it out because you make a very essential point. This is what a PhD educator does, is they shadow doctors like AK and Dr. Setu Raman and find out what are these doctors doing which are making them a standout educators. Then they analyze it and throw in principles and then it looks very structured. You don't have to go from one step to one, two, three, four, five. A lot of time, five, the fifth step may be done as the second step the third step may be done in the fourth step. So they keep changing. The doctors keep, and they are so adept at, it's like a great, it's like a football field, soccer. Uh, these these uh, doctors are so good at understanding where the ball is going to be, that they are already there when the ball is there. 
and they cannot explain to you what they do as dr sethuraman mentioned uh, but they they did and i agree that this was not that's why it didn't take me much time to learn it it was exactly like what you said that i realized oh my god this is this is what the name for this is this is what the thing this is and so and then it became good when you attach a name to a to to an idea it becomes more permanent so you have to and then we need a language to convey it to audience like you we cannot say oh i am a great teacher and this is what i do i go in the morning and i do so you have to have a principle and so these educators have written it down for us and given us the road map on how to proceed from a to b i'm sure in anesthesia you have all the steps your anesthesia i can guarantee you is not very different from anesthesia and mayo the techniques and the rigor and the uh, skill that you use there might be some more technical stuff but but the real skill of learning is the same uh Professor Sajid Sethraman, would you like to? Yeah, just one last question, um, uh, Amit, uh, about this. Uh, uh, American Medical Association uh, launched some innovations. No, 33 medical schools join. I don't know if Mayo is one of the 33 consortium. Any idea what is uh, going on in the past? Uh, now it is the fourth or fifth year in progress. yeah i think i think that group uh, there's a dr lotty derby she's she's in the medical school in the research area i'm sure we have heard about it the lot of these innovations have come out from uh, student burnout and uh, student well being and how to bring the curriculum faster to them without uh, without burning them out i mean there is always a new thing we add on to the students curriculum as if uh, they don't have enough and when i was a student i it was already overwhelming as to what we had learned and we had hardly any much more uh resource left for getting anything new and now every doctor comes up with his own new way of doing and learning so this innovation is to find out how in a in in a very structured fashion dr um, anand krishnan mentioned it best professor anand krishnan the team based learning the group based learning working in a group working in a team uh, these innovations are actually in that group but i am very happy to report that the students now um, they are collaborative they are working with each other they exchange blogs they exchange twitters they are much faster in resources they have all kinds of they have youtube videos and so these are the things of capturing the knowledge so it's more of a knowledge management and knowledge transfer a lot of these research is going away is knowledge management and the other thing the research is happening is at the point so when i am with the patient at the point i need this information how can i get a credible information in a very brief succinct evidence based manner not have to read the whole pdf of it so these are the kind of uh, hands on things which are going on of course they have to be validated studied um but the more new things are coming the more i hear things which i which i learned in jipmar uh, the narrative medicine the storytelling uh, the empathy the understanding the whole holistic picture so more it's similar i mean it it comes to the same thing and the interaction between the teacher and the student so i think we are we are coming back to the same understanding same how how knowledge is transferred but using different platforms Okay then. So, any other batchmate want to say anything? Or maybe even <clears throat> anybody who's logged in, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself. Giri, you uh, want to come in? Giri, sir, Ram Subramanian. Actually, I just wanted to have a small comment. like uh, we had very good teachers when we were in jitma and we were a very small batch but problem now here is like professor what professor ak had said each batch is now 150 or 250 depending on the size of the college and uh, they get uh, very little exposure compared to what we had and second thing is what i am really worried is this bedside clinics is now totally become outdated nobody teaches uh, by the side of the patient 
any clinical class all the classes are being conducted only in air conditioned rooms and uh, only with one patient they discuss and uh, i still remember my classes used to be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in the ward in one corner where only the professor will have a fan over his head all of us have to sta- stand at least 5 to 10 feet away and so that we can talk loudly and we are the professor has to hear what we talk so that was the way we were trained and unfortunately with all these innovations now teaching us i think is gone for a six it is not like what we had i'm really saddened by the loss of uh, bedside clinics nobody i i don't find anybody taking and when i call them like i'll take the class at the ba- side of the patient in the ward i find half the class has gone out and most of them have got very good resources and uh, you ask a question the answer will come after 5 minutes when you are seeing the next patient immediately they'll google and find out what the answer is and they'll tell you and they'll forget but my professor like what i was trained as you always have a book in your hand the moment first thing he told me in the class is you learn to say i don't know loudly and immediately note down the question go find out what is the answer and tell him tomorrow and that way i think we don't forget whatever uh, we learn so this is a very sad state of affairs we have now no thank you thank you uh, dr rama subramaniam rama um when i had gone for a workshop to learn evidence based medicine in oxford that was exactly what they did they gave us a card about the things you don't know uh, and you immediately write it down and and you try to do search and find out so that was a i remember they had a they gave us an entire diary to write down all the questions at the end of each session we had like five six seven questions on best diagnosis best treatment prognosis so those were the stimulators i i i i i i completely understand what you are saying um but you have to kind of they have many more resources now they have youtube videos they are looking at physical exam and all that youtube videos and with covid it has become a much more harder uh, to teach and harder to motivate and and i think the next innovation which is going to come is how to do everything that which i have said and others have said uh, through telehealth and telecommunication through zoom technology um so one of the thing which every educator has to learn and i didn't learn when i was there is how to communicate how to be a public speaker so one of the thing which every doctor has to learn is how to be a good public speaker so taking some formal public speaking course like we have toastmasters international here i understand it's there in india too uh, encouraging your students and you yourself can be a member there you learn speaking skills on the fly and it becomes really uh, a very good skill to have uh, not only to be a good writer but to be a good speaker and to motivate it's not automatic it's a learned skill it can be learned it's one of the things people are scared of um but it can be it can be learned and overcome so that i would really emphasize but uh, before you go rama i have seen you do uh, video consult i mean um, in apicon i have seen you do all these educational sessions on endoscopies and cirrhosis live in different centers we like to talk about the techniques you use in getting that kind of team approach to medicine actually we do it in a uh... hospital setting and we beam it to the audience here uh, through the internet they do live uh, procedures we select the case and keep and uh, we do that live procedures and this is seen by the audience it's there in all the workshops especially uh, super specialty workshops it's at a different level they do very complex procedures and uh, it is seen by the audience it's a two way interaction thank you yeah i have attended your sessions it were very helpful um, and i know somebody who skilled in that area will pick up from the techniques that you use how to hold the endoscopy how to uh, what to do and you're already also talking through the process and that's very helpful so i think we have to think about the way we are um educating and it's not one size fit all so i think 
we would like to hear from your resource when you are challenged in that situation, how you're making it happen. And so that's going to be very interesting um, knowledge base. And conferences like AME and others are, we have educators who come from India and other places where they, those sessions are all jam-packed where they want to know how are you doing it in India and how fantastic it is because we know you have a lot of resources patient-wise. And so, and you're strapped as far as teachers are considered, you have very few teachers. How are you doing it? You have to adopt to technology. You have to use it, make it your friend. I don't see any other way around it. There has to be a pre-work, a work during your seeing and post-work. So your students, you have to give them homework. This is what I'm going to do in the next day. And these patients will so study these articles. I'll be asking this question, things like that to keep. So you have to plan not at the, on that day, but it has to be pre-planning. That's the experiential learning which will happen. Thank you, Dr. Amit. I think, um, shall we call it a day with you or you want yes, some more? Yes, uh, unless anyone has any comment or question, uh, Professor Subara, would you like to say something? You'll have to unmute yourself, sir. You're muted, Professor Subara. Well, uh, uh, yes. People said, I think uh, Jipmar is unique that way, that uh, uh, having a teacher's training center has helped uh, many of the teachers to develop innovative methods of teaching, at least for a small group of uh, motivated students. So that way, I think uh, those who are graduated from Jipmar are fortunate. But I can tell you that uh, those uh, motivated students will learn even in other uh, state medical colleges uh, when the teachers are really good. Most of the times uh, what they say is the devotion for teaching is the most important uh, criteria for a good teacher. Most of the teachers do not have the devotion. Unless they have the devotion, I don't think uh, they'll be able to do a good job. In spite of getting training, in spite of having various methods, uh, unless they have their own interest in teaching, because we can make out that those teachers who are interested in teaching, they really do a good job. Apart from that, I think uh, it is always better for everybody to get trained in various methods of teaching. As people say that medical teachers are the ones who are totally not trained at all, but now I think at least uh, the, the, there are uh, uh, centers where uh, they are getting training and even uh, Medical Council of India insists that all uh, medical teachers should get this uh, training. I think... Uh, Thank, Thank you, Dr. Subara. I didn't realize uh, Subara was there. <laughs> nice meeting you after a long time. <laughs> and uh, uh, now, I think, uh, sitting at home. Ramachandran, uh, one, one and a half of 30 seconds for you. I know you are a very quiet person. I didn't realize also. He's a 10 years super senior to the batch of 80. Can I unmute and say something? Is he still there? Associate Dean of SRMC. Yes. Dr. Ramchandran? Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. yeah carry on, carry on. Yeah, so uh, really enjoyed the session. So there are uh, really nice uh, sitting here listening to the teachers again. And uh, we really go back uh, in time and how we really enjoyed uh, work, I mean, learning from you and then working under you. So it's, a, it's a, something which we imbibe. I mean, more than I can say we formally learned. It is an, uh, it's all coming back. So. We think that we will be able to give that kind of experience to our students. We are trying our best, sir. Yes, nobody worked under me ever. They only worked with me, always. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So that is a key to be you know, appreciated after so many years also. Because people yes, always work with, not under. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Amit, for uh, agreeing to do this talk at uh, extremely short notice. And uh, thank you once again, uh, 
Chetraman sir for readily accept, accepting and uh, Dr. Anand Krishnan to always be there when we try to do anything. Uh, your uh, support and your uh, uh, presence is uh, really appreciated, sir. Thank you so much. And thanks, Pata, for uh, giving me this opportunity to try and put. So, uh, henceforth, uh, every Thursday we will have uh, a topic which is not may not be hardcore surgery, but it will be something that is useful to uh, all medical professionals. So, I welcome you all on every Thursday at 8 p.m. Uh, Pata, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I mean, I guess... Uh, so nice. People don't see cricket match. I am surprised, man. So many are there. <laughs> I expect only really five or six. <laughs> Anyway, and uh, all that I can say is uh, it's been a wonderful session and it's so nice to uh, listen to Amit speak so well and so eloquent and you know from from the heart and of course it's so nice to see Dr. Seth Raman and Dr. Anand Krishnan and Dr. Subarao and so many others. Uh, thank you all so much for keeping awake late night and uh, we shall meet again uh, coming Thursday. Thanks Vidya. Thank you all. Good night everybody and thank you once again. Thank you. Yes, bye bye. bye.